Thank you for staying with us. If you're still staying with us, and if you're just joining us, thank you for joining us. This is Report Desk Africa on New Central Television. We first talked about Nigeria and the Nigerian and uh, Nigerian politics, basically. Now we're going to Liberian politics. Now, Liberian President George Opangwea is set to face challenger Joseph Baokai in November 14th runoff votes, marking a significant movement, a moment, I beg your pardon, in the country's electoral history. Now, this rematch comes after their 2017 face-off which resulted in Weir winning 60% of the votes, marking Liberia's first democratic uh, or marking yes Liberia's first democratic transfer of power since the end of the devastating civil war between 1989 and 2003. Now, Weir's leadership has faced criticisms for failing to deliver on key campaign pledges and address the issues of justice for civil war victims. Now, Boakai, who served as vice president under Ellen Justin Sirleaf. Africa's first democratically elected female leader is running on a platform to rescue Liberia from what he perceives as Ware's failed leadership. This upcoming runoff votes holds significance, holds significance for Liberia's future as both candidates seek to address pressing challenges and fulfill promises to the nation's citizens. And of course, uh, joining us right now to shed more light on this is international human rights advocate and of course, a public affairs analyst all the way from Liberia, Adam Kane. Adam, thank you so much for your time. Thank you as well for your time. So thank you. All right, so let's get straight to it. Uh, what specific demographic or regional or even socioeconomic factors have contributed to the closely contested runoff in Liberia? And how might these factors sway the outcome? Oh, please say that again. I think you were breaking up. Can you say that again, please? Okay, so basically I'm asking that uh, what specific demographic or regional or even socioeconomic factors have contributed uh, to the closely contested uh, runoff elections uh, in Liberia? And how might these factors actually uh, shape the outcome? Uh, as we uh, uh, look at the election results, I think uh, what we have seen over these uh, uh, election is the fact that uh, the country is totally divided relative to the votes that were cast. Uh, there were uh, 43 plus percent and 43 plus percent of people who voted for the ruling party and those who voted for the opposition. We sagaciously suggest that uh, there is a division or divide within the country. So, uh, uh, but if we were to analyze the result, it also uh, shows that uh, opposition, given the other numbers of the 18 other political parties, that opposition actually stated that they wanted the ruling party out. Because if we were to combine all the numbers, then the oppositional parties that participated in the election actually uh, have more numbers. Uh, uh, but I, again, boycott. The opposition is uh, closely uh, in line with the ruling party, and so I think they. I I, I cannot put a put a uh, pin on what would be the outcome, but I think what we can say is that I think there are a lot of people who are disenchanted relative to the uh, uh, the president uh, leadership within the past six years. That's mm. what I would say. Okay, thank you for that. Now, we know that between the last election and this election, there have been changes between the changes from, you know, whether the voters or the political parties or even contestants. Now, I want to ask, how have political parties and, um, you know, alliances evolved in Liberia since 2017 elections? Have there been any noteworthy shifts or realignments that could influence this uh, particular or this, this current race? Well, there has been a lot of uh, conflicts uh, uh, prior to to the election between oppositional party, there was a breakout. And uh, one of the things I think we have seen over these years is that uh, in order uh, hold on. in order to win an election, there must be a, uh, there must be an alliance uh, in order to win the election or to win the ruling party. But there have been a lot of conflicts in between uh, since this uh, 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 process to the election. So uh, currently. As we speak, there are a lot of uh, oppositions that the opposition party, leading opposition party, will have to negotiate. So I think the best negotiator in this uh, or during this time of this uh, uh, election 
will deter me out of the next outcome because everyone is trying to negotiate, sell their platform to the next political parties that will not be participating in this election. And uh, who knows, the best negotiator might get the deal going. But there has been conflicts uh, uh, before the elections and there is a separation between the uh, opposition parties. So I hope and pray that they will be able to put themselves together and if they desire to unseat George Weir, then uh, there must be an alliance in order to do that. And so uh, the negotiation started and people are playing their card very well to make sure that they bring all the people on board. And that's what's going on currently in Liberia. Now, could you provide some sort of depth to the present issues that Liberia is currently facing? And how do the policy proposals of Weir and uh, Boakai differ in addressing these particular challenges? Well, first, uh, the, the major challenge now, I think, in the country is that the country is divided, uh, and that is due to the political campaign and the co political uh, 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 experience we just had. And so I'm hoping that uh, there will be uh, some reconciliation, whoever becomes the president or whoever wins, that they will be able to reconcile the entire country. Other than that, uh, the major, the major, the major problem in Liberia is uh, corruption. Uh, if corruption is alleviated to some extent, then we can have a better educational system. If corruption is alleviated to some extent, we can have a good healthcare system because then money that is uh, intended for healthcare, money intended for education, money intended for other areas will go into the various areas. So like all the African countries and around the world, I think corruption is like a real major problem. And one we can lay that then I'm 100% sure that Liberia can move to the highest or the, uh, the stage in which we desire Liberia to move. But Adam, corruption, again, is a problem. Yes. Adam, I would like you to, of course, shed more light on the context. When you say corruption, how, uh, well, I use the word endemic is uh, this uh, particular issue. And uh, in what context? Can you just give us a scenario of how much of a problem it is in Liberia? Well, Liberia problem of corruption is an age-old problem. So it's not just the we are government. Even previous government have demonstrated some level of corruption, even the government after and the government after. So again, it's an endemic, it's very endemic within the culture. So corruption would be misappropriation of funding. Corruption would be where a uh, certain percentage of governmental feature are living on the country wealth while the poor people, the majority of the poor people suffer. Uh, using money to build infrastructures, or building personal uh, 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 mansions and personal uh, uh, structures while the rest of the people struggle and sending your children as a politician out of the country and while the educational system and structure in Liberia is beyond or below anything as you can think about. So there are a lot of uh, a contextual uh, uh, analysis relative to corruption. But I think what it speaks more about is just few people enjoying while the rest of the people not being able to even survive. And that is very bad. So having a budget that just looking at the legislative, legislative budget is even higher than even the developmental funding in the country. So that is problematic in itself. And paying legislature uh, uh, those in the uh, the house and in the senate more money than even the united states of america in a poor country liberia is one of the poorest country in the world but we pay our senator get paid more money than uh, senators in the united states of america and that in itself is a serious problem mm -hmm. that helps to uh, uh present what corruption looks like in the plain picture Mm, so sadly. I think those are some of the problems, yeah, mm. contextual. Definitely. Sadly, that, that is actually um, a common problem across many African countries. Now, just before we, we wrap this up, uh, Adam, I, I want to quickly ask you this in a very um, few minutes. Um, during election periods, all eyes are usually, apart from the ruling party and then the opposition parties, there is the Electoral Commission. Um, and now that this election has gone into a runoff, would you say that this is a win for the Electoral Commission? Will you say the Commission has done well? Are Liberians satisfied with the performance of the commission so far or the fact that it has gone into a runoff does it mean that the commission um didn't do well enough where do liberians stand concerning the electoral commission so far well the international community gave a part on the back of the uh, election commission i think they said it did well but uh, if we were to do critical analysis i think there needs to be some level of adjustment uh 
uh, uh, with Liberia election. And I would strongly propose one of the major adjustments that need to be made is to change the Liberia electoral period of time. Uh, so that uh, we cannot be conducting election during the rainy season, which is very problematic. As a result of the rainy season, uh, we are unable to take uh, a, a, a logistic to other areas because of the rainy season. I, I think there need to be a, 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 a reformation to that particular act so that it can go to another day within the dry season. Another thing that we will notice uh, is just, again, material of uh, a ballot paper not reaching on time will also create a problem. I think we need to uh, uh, in, uh, improve that. Uh, those are some of the things. But I think they did well uh, in my estimate because they got a part uh, uh, appraisal from the international community. We showed that they did a session as well. Of course, there are some glitches along the way that these are just minor uh, uh, issues that uh, not undermine or, uh, or legitim legitimize the election. All right, Adam Kain, thank you so much for shedding more light on this. And uh, we wish Liberia and Liberians well in the forthcoming run of elections. Our eyes will also be on Liberia for that period. And we hope that the best candidate comes out tops. Thank you so much for joining us once again. Thank you, too. All right. Now, we'll go on this very quick break. And when we come back, Dakwa Digboye will be taking us through the forecast, some of the stories that we'll be expecting or that we are putting our eyes on come the following week. Do stay with us. This is still Report Desk Africa. Let's look into the crystal ball and uh, let's see what it has in store for us. The United Nations Agency estimates that there were 110 million displaced people globally in mid-June, uh, about 1.6 million more than at the same time in 2022, according to its report compiling data for the first half of 2023. Now, a UNHCR spokesperson confirmed to AFP that a 114 million figure was a record since the agency began collecting data in 1975. Now, according to the agency, however, this figure rose again over the following three months to probably exceeding 114 million by the end of the coming months. Let's move to South Africa now, where we understand that according to the World Bank, the frequent power cuts have severely impacted South Africa's economy, slowing its GDP growth. And of course, the World Bank will loan South Africa $1 billion to help the economy resolve its energy crisis as it battles with its worst ever power cuts. Now, the World Bank also said that the loan will allow South Africa to reform the country's state-owned power utility, uh, ESCOM, which has more than $26 billion of debt. Now let's move to Kenya, where we also understand that uh, the sudden free fall of the Nairan shillings versus the US dollar caused widespread shock and alarm, and the banking and investment industries hitting a record low of 1,200 Nigerian Naira, and uh, 150 shillings per dollar on Monday. The currency continues to lose its value rapidly against the dollar. Now, plagued by inflation, economists have predicted an historic exchange rate in due to strengthening of the U.S. currency, partly to high yields on U.S. Treasury bonds. And of course, that's what we have our eyes on, on the crystal ball.
Mm, one mm. thing I know we're going to be keeping our eyes on is the steady fall of the naira, naira against the yes, dollar, really, particularly really here in Nigeria. In Nigeria. Like you, you were um, emphasizing earlier, it really is affecting everything and anything that you can put your hands on or you can put your money on, as a matter of fact, in Nigeria. Yeah, I mean, it's really, really, uh, I will use the word uh, sad and rather um, disturbing too, because I also understand that uh, it, it affects basic, uh, well, it's, it's pretty basic if you're a businessman, mm. aviation. Right now, people want to fly, you know, travel by aeroplane, have to pay almost double, if not more, mm. you know, to, to go about their, you know, private trips or business trips or even luxury trips. So, uh, and also imports and exports. Uh, right now, even social media influencers, people that <laughs> right now trade in, you know, uh, foreign currency and mm. they have to do the conversion to Naira. I met recently a local hair vendor uh, she actually advertises her goods on social media. They said, hey, right now, lead women hair extensions, you know, mm. the Brazilian, the Peruvian, Peruvian hair, and Nigerian. all of that, that it's pretty much expensive right now. Someone mm. said he wanted to get a particular component. Uh, as at last week in Nigeria, Naira, I priced it to about 3,000. Right now, it's over 4,000 Naira. You want to buy something as basic as a uh, turkey for you know, those that buy it in kilos. Mm. Before, I know at some point, you know, based on street value, it was about 2,005, no, 3,000, uh, about that, 400. That, that right now, <laughs> right now it's over 5,000. Sorry, I like to be very, very practical, right? I, so I that's just to give our viewers a, an idea of how much of an impact the exchange rate difference is having I, I, on I, basic I, I totally get, as we leave that point, I, I understand and that things are really getting bad and Nigerians are complaining. My only surprise is how you know the price of hair extensions and turkey. You're not married, Dako. How I, do you know these things? But that's a like, question I'm, for I'm, another I'm day. I'm a reporter that's and, 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 and I so <laughs> thank you for ask a lot of questions. <laughs> thank you for joining us on Report Desk Africa. My name is Bernard Akide. Thank you so much. Keep it locked on this station again for another episode of Report Desk Africa. Um, next week, same station, same time. Again, my name is Bernard Akede. And of course, this is Dakwa Adigbo. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure he's calculating <laughs> the price of hair extensions <laughs> and talking in the market. Thank, you so, much, Thank you so much for staying with us. Thank you for joining us. See you again yeah, same time for now. next week.